I had to decide quickly, do I stay here doing nothing and developing somebody else's country? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or do I go back to my country and try and develop and provide a service that I know people desperately need? Yeah. This is a word to everybody else out there, come back. We need you. <laughs> I can't do it alone. I'm Vanessa Canby and I'm here with Michael Matthews who has a solar energy business which is so cool and I cannot wait to find out more and how he got into this business. Thanks so much for joining me. You're welcome. Thank so, you for having me. <laughs> no problem. So how did you get started with this business? Um, I was in the UK working in an office and I came to realise that um, Africa is basically the next China and we can't make the mistakes we have made in the past because most of the issues we have with climate change right now stems from a lot of the activity that took place in China over the last 20 years based on obviously the, the growth and the amount of concrete being poured and amount of coal being burned just to fuel that huge machinery of development right now looking at what we've seen in china we know that africa is the next and the planet simply cannot afford to have another growth well another fossil fuel growth basically if you will so i thought i think we have to do something about it so i decided that i take it upon myself to accelerate the transition of Africa to renewable energy mm -hmm. and to do that starting with solar because obviously we are in Africa yeah. it's a lot of sun mm -hmm. so why not yeah I mean it's the perfect place to have solar energy because yeah as you, as you said <laughs> th there's sun every day every single, every day. single day and for the same amount of time especially here in Ghana because yeah. we're so close to the equator you don't get that moving hour back no 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 that yeah I know <laughs> So how did you actually get started and what sort of projects are you working on at the moment? So I got started basically with by looking for partners in the UK. So I have a partner company I work with in the UK. So how they, does that work? So they have uh, a lot of good engineers because what I found when I came to Ghana is we have we, we don't have the, the technical skills and if we do there are not many of them not many people with those skills so the idea was to partner with a company in the UK who had credibility who've done it before who'd done large-scale projects before and then we decided after meeting them sitting down and explaining to them the opportunities in Ghana um, it took me a long time to find the right company but eventually I did and I mean we got on very well they understood I flew them into Ghana they did a few installations for us, so got a feel of Ghana, what it was like, and they had an amazing time. They loved it. And then, you know, and then we started taking upon ourselves to train some of the local electricians here, lo local engineers, started working with some of the schools to take on people, to train as well. And things just start snowballing, snowballing from there because I think what we find is, or what we found when we, when we first arrived was that there was a credibility issue in the solar industry, like solar installation industry, because there were a lot of companies who claimed to do solar, mm -hmm. who claimed that they were experts in the solar installation, but what happened is they sold people the dream, or they didn't manage expectations properly, and ended up making mistakes in the installation that they've done. And what that does is, it's very simple, because you know, it's like me doing an installation for you, if it doesn't work out, tell somebody else, oh, that sort of thing, it's, it's a dream, it's not even true, it doesn't work. And on and on and on. But luckily we're slowly turning the tide. Um, we've done a few very good projects in Ghana. Um, we have a good project coming up, actually, which you're welcome to join me oh, and have thanks. a look at. Oh, thanks, yeah, we, we will be there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, it's for Latter-day Saints, the church. So we have a few churches that we're working with, some of the mega churches uh, we're working with as well. We have some factories that we've done installations for. 
and I mean the demand for solo is incredible oh, right, right? Okay. so That's good to hear. at the moment it's we can't get the panels in fast enough you know and it would be nice if you know we can work closer with the government and the the, the agencies in Ghana to sort of make things a little bit easier for us because at the end of the day I, I personally believe that um, solar is the key to supercharge the development of a country like Ghana mm -hmm. because I heard a, a wise woman once say that Africa cannot develop in the dark and based on our level of consumption based on the doom so and all of these activities that we find surrounding energy, Africa is trying to develop in the dark and I think that's, the, that's what's holding, holding us back. And does the government have any initiatives to help with, <laughs> you know, green energy, solar, that sort of thing? I mean, in, I thought they did at one point, but I only to found out, find out that it's, I mean, it was actually to do with the customs, where you were allowed, you, were, you, were, you, weren't, you didn't pay duty if your items were brought together in one container. Okay. So if you had your panels, your inverters, your batteries all in a container, you wouldn't pay any duty. But I found out that, you know, <laughs> it looks like the customs guys, they want their money. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't liking this. So <laughs> they went to the government and were like, yo, <laughs> we don't like this. We need that. So you got cancelled. Um, doesn't oh, happen anymore. I know, but um, I, I, I think we're getting to a point or to a stage now where solar can stand on its own um, as long as as long as they're willing to play ball with us and treat us as fairly as any other business i think we're getting to a point where we don't really need government intervention what we really need um, if any if, there, if there's a, if there's if there's a need as such is more financial support particularly for the everyday Ghanaian who you know, has a two bedroom, three bedroom property, um, who is very interested in solar, mm -hmm. right? And, but they can't finance it because the issue with solar is even though you, you get generation for 25 to 30 years plus, um, it's that upfront initial cost, mm -hmm. right? Um, what you find is in, in Europe, in the UK, for example, you have where the, the companies that work with the government to, to provide that sort of financing for people to make that initial installation and then pay back the, these companies. Yeah. Uh, almost like a mini mortgage for your installation type of thing. But in Ghana, you don't really get that. So currently you find that most of the installations we do are with the, the big players. Mm -hmm. the people who can afford to cough that money up front, you know. And it's, I mean, it, they, they, it makes sense. It makes sense for them because I think just from the, the, the projects that we've done, we find that you know they tend to get their return on investment back in three to six years is wow. sort of the area. And if you if you work out that like your panels are going to be generating for 25, 30 years, yeah, it definitely makes sense. It makes sense, but but then the other the other ish, the other side to it is you do get a lot of old school fat cats at the top who you know either they don't understand the technology or they believe it's a dream or they just don't want to cough up that money up front and my response to them is I mean if you want to keep giving ECG your money for the next 25 plus years be my guest but when your competitors switch to solar and you find that you're not competitive anymore and you have to close your business down don't be sad yeah I mean what is the issue for people that don't know their no for people that don't know about it, what is the issue with electricity here? Why does it go off? Why is there doom so? So I think it's, if you analyze it, which I have done, it's basically down to the fact that we're trying to run a 21st century operation off of a you know, system that was built <laughs> almost 60 years ago, plus, you know, by Kwame Nkrumah and, and the actual, way that that has been managed or is being managed is hasn't actually caught up with the 21st century use of electricity right, oh, right. the demand is, is skyrocketing but it's almost impossible to sort of meet that demand with legacy um, installations right with the you know the power purchase agreements that people have um, 
usually are not actually beneficial or they are they either, either you know the, uh, the being purchased at too high a price whereby it's affecting the profits that are being made and then obviously you know ECG is running at loss which also oh, affects right. the, the fact that they can't upgrade systems, they can't you know, innovate with the systems they have. So I think it, it basically comes down to the fact that the, the, systems, the system is quite old and need, in, in drastic need of modernization. Is it that the government is just trying to save money? Like, do they just switch it off basically to save money yeah. and switch it on? Uh, or it's not really it's, about it's, that? It's hard to save money you don't have. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and unfortunately, um, I mean, a, a lot of the a lot of the issues currently is is financial because you know if you can't afford to upgrade a system, mm -hmm. that is probably sort of taking care of say 10, 50 million people, and then your population is going from 10, 50 million to almost 30 million, and you're still trying to run <laughs> the same system yeah, to supply you know twice as many you know they're, they're, they're going, to be, going to be issues there's going to be an issue it's going to be an issue it all boils down to the fact that the the technology they're trying to i mean it's they're running you know windows 95 and you know where <laughs> <laughs> windows 95 was a long time ago you know so i mean it comes down to that and okay. until they, they they make that conscious decision to step into 21st century, you know, approach people like myself, who has, you know, detailed understanding about, you know, large utility, you know, scale operations and how, you know, they've made it work in the West, like in the UK and in Europe, you know, then, you know, unfortunately, they're fighting a losing battle mm -hmm. and they'll keep losing because eventually the technology is just going to overrun them. Yeah. You know, it to get to a point where maybe solar becomes so cheap that, upfront costs are no longer an issue mm -hmm. so where does ECG go when everyone is you know buying spending maybe a year's worth of you know uh, ECG on, funds yeah, on installing solar mm -hmm. and then no, no longer paying ECG yeah you know so it, it will eventually get to that stage the question is are they willing to come and see us pay our consultancy fees have us explain to them exactly what's coming and how they can get around it, how they can keep their businesses profitable. Um, it's up to them. But anyway, you, you can't escape, you can't esca escape technology, mm. especially when it's coming at you this fast. So if an ordinary person like me came yep. and I want to build, let's say, a three bedroom house, yep. how much approximately would the solar cost? I will quote you between ten to $15,000. Okay, and do you charge in dollars or do you charge in CDs? Oh, I charge in CDs, we're in Ghana. So, okay, so, so like CDs. the equivalent. But equivalent, I say equivalent because the CD keeps moving. I mean, recently it hasn't been so bad. It's actually been okay. Oh, that's good. So, now keep doing what you're doing. Um, but the CD has been quite stable um, oh, that's good. recently. So, but we, we, we charge in CDs. Okay, so we 10, do everything in CDs. <laughs> 10 to $15,000 <laughs> yeah. for uh, about an average three bedroom yeah. house. I know you're an international viewership is very international and you know so i get it so <laughs> dollars if you want i can give you a pound quote if you want <laughs> euros as well if you want so how did you get here so like let's take it right back okay. where were you born where oh are your God. parents from <laughs> and where were you raised oh here we go uh so i was actually born in nigeria lagos oh, okay. um my mom is Ghanaian, but she's part scottish uh, never been Related, to Scotland. Basically. <laughs> yeah, basically. Uh, my dad is Nigerian, but he grew up in Ghana. He's, he's Ghanaian, really. He spends his whole life in Ghana, so he's pretty much a Ghanaian. Um, but we were, we were back in Nigeria for, for, we moved back to Nigeria for a short period of time, and in that period I was born. Oh. <laughs> uh, we moved back to Ghana um, when I was 10, uh, and stayed in Ghana, went to Achimota. Uh, left when I finished Achimota, I went to the UK to live with my mum out there and yeah so I studied in the UK, I studied law in the UK, I graduated law school 2010. Wow, that's, <laughs> that's a long time. We're old, <laughs> we're getting old. Yeah, uh, 2010 and yeah so I mean I worked, I worked in the UK for some time you know trying to figure out what, what it is I was passionate about and 
came back. I came back. I came yeah. back. I, I mean, it all comes down to this. People say, oh, you came back. I, I mean, it comes down to... I had to ask myself every morning, what, um, what am I doing here? Is it making a difference? Mm -hmm. in being in the UK, you know, working in an office. And then I worked for one of the you know, largest telecommunications companies in the world, right? But I'm just a cog in a machine, not really making an impact, a significant impact, you know? So I had to decide quickly, do I stay here doing nothing and developing somebody else's country? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or do I, go back to my country and try and develop and provide a service that I know people desperately need. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's as simple as that. Amazing. Well, it's great to hear that you came <laughs> back to yeah. Ghana. And this is, this is a word to everybody else out there. Come back. We need you. <laughs> I can't do it alone. I love how you're desperately like, speaking. <laughs> Just call me. I'll, I'll tell you whatever you need to know. Just come back. We need as many people in the diaspora moving back to Africa. You know, you have people with so many skills, you know, is it carpentry skills, is it construction skills, IT skills, training skills. I mean, we need everything, everything yeah. right? So the sooner you can get, if you're coming over here to just sell water, well, you, you, can, you can make money doing just selling water. Whatever you do in Europe or in America or in China, wherever you are, whatever you do there, you can do it here and make money mm -hmm. and succeed and you have a nicer life doing it and you'll yeah. be home. So how was growing up in Ghana and going to school here? Because Achimota, it's a boarding school, isn't yeah, it? School. How was, was it? <laughs> that was, it was the best years of my life. It was the worst years of my life because, I mean, you have to remember, I came straight from Nigeria to a Ghanaian boarding school. Yeah. And there is a stigmatization of Nigerians yeah. being, I mean, people used to think, oh, you eat people and stuff like that. When I, when I was in boarding school, they're like, they're like, ah, oh, we heard Nigerians eat people. I mean, you're a kid, you're, you're a kid, right? Yeah. It's just stories you hear. Boarding school here was, was fun. Like, it was, it was great. I made some very good friends here. You know, I got to pick up language while I, you know, while I was here, which is quite handy. Um, you got to experience actual Ghanaian culture because you know what I think what happens a lot is people come to Ghana for education and they they either they go to maybe like international schools and maybe it's not a bo boarding system there and you know they go from their house in I don't know Reggio Manuel or Villaggio or whatever right straight to school and then straight home so they don't really get to experience that Ghanaian culture but when you were when you were in boarding school like I was in Achimota, my dad made sure I didn't go to any of the international schools. He's like, you go into Achimota, you real Ghanaian, experience it, right? So, you know, you get you get to pick up the actual culture. Mm -hmm. You know, you get to understand the way people communicate, you get to understand the actual people in the country. Yeah. And I think for me that was priceless mm -hmm. in terms of an education. I mean the education system is amazing. But the actual education in the culture of the country and the people yeah. was the most important. I mean, I'll give you an example of one of the stories that, you know, why it was so fun. So we had to fetch our own water, right? From where? From a big, huge poly tank that was oh, in the right. middle. Okay. I thought you were going to say, it, like, it, from it, a well. Yeah, like well, 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 it gets, it gets. And then sometimes, you know, because it's a boarding school, a lot of, you know, boys, you know, fighting to get water, and then the poly tank runs out, right? Yeah, I had a shower. You need a bath, so you have to go and steal water from somewhere, right? And our go-to place was at Chimota Golf Course. Sorry, people, we were the ones with your water. <laughs> so we used to sneak into that Chimota. Can you imagine being, what, 12 years old, in the dead of night, sneaking into a Chimota Golf Course? Club to steal water <laughs> from then, like from the rivers that they have. No, so they have oh, these. Rivers. They have because they, because of the golf course, right? They have these taps strategically located oh, right. okay. and have a lot of water there. So we will have to go make sure the security guys don't get you. We'll get the water, get in, get out, and then if you get spotted by security, you have to make it back with a full bucket of water because obviously, you know, you can't come back. Empty-handed, empty you have to run with that bucket of water, and sometimes, sometimes, some people, some people didn't make it. Some people didn't make it back, so you know, they, they had no water when they got back. You know, was, and, and, and things like that. Like you don't, I mean, you don't get to do things like that 
no, I don't think in Europe, maybe, yeah. it's, but it's just little experiences, right? Mm. <laughs> and how was Nigeria in comparison to Ghana? So I guess yeah. as an adult, you've also been back to Nigeria. I haven't been back to Nigeria since I left, oh, actually. I know, it's crazy. It's crazy. I've been so busy. And I don't know, maybe I just, it just never had happened. I've, you know, I've had a reason to go back to Nigeria, not yet anyway. Can you remember what it was like when you oh, were yeah. there? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And Nigeria, how does it compare? Yeah, Nigeria was tough. Like Nigeria is not um, an easy place to be, okay. right? You have to, you have to be street smart. If you're not, you're gonna learn by force. You have to be good with people. You know, you have to learn to keep yourself safe. Um, and if, if you think, if, if you consider the, just the population of people in Nigeria is, you know, it's, it's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like every single person in there is fighting to get ahead, mm -hmm. right? And when you have the resources not being, you know, enough sufficient for everyone, then you get that doggy dog mentality. So Nigeria, you have a lot more of that, right? That's why you have, that's why you, you get that impression of Nigerians being go-getters because they know if they don't, they don't hustle hard, they don't make it, mm -hmm. you know? But it's a, in, in Ghana, it's a bit, is it, you know, it's doggy dog as well, it's hard, but it's a little slower pace. People are a bit more considerate to other people. You know, there is, you know, a little bit more of an understanding between Ghanaians, but, but in, in Nigeria, it's quite, it's quite, it's a lot more of a confrontational mm -hmm. environment. At least from when I was there, the experience I had, you know, and, you know, and I would say Nigeria in some areas are more dangerous than Ghana. Oh, Just maybe because of its size, it's harder to police or, you know, so you have to be very careful where you go. You know, I have some crazy stories from when I was living in Nigeria. You know, don't get me wrong, Nigeria was very fun. You know, it was a fun childhood, play with my friends and, but you have to be careful, you know, because there was always that scare of, Oh, don't get. I mean, just common sense stuff. Like if you if someone offers you something, don't take it. But that actually rings true a lot more mm -hmm. in Nigeria when I lived there. Anyway, maybe now it's paradise. I don't know. I haven't been there. Maybe someone used to send me some stuff about what Nigeria is like now. But. I mean, I I went like a couple of years ago to Lagos and. I mean, I wasn't living there. I was there for like, what, like 40 hours. I don't think that was a very good like representation, but I had a great time. I had fun, but I'm sure, you know, like it's a different story maybe if you're living there and especially in like certain neighborhoods and yeah. stuff like that. My, my Nigerian brothers, holler at me. Tell me what it's like. I want to know. I see, I see you guys partying out there a lot though. Some serious partying yeah, in no, Nigeria. Yeah, no, the partying was actually amazing. Yeah? Like the clubs and stuff. Hit me up. They, like Ghana has nothing on Nigeria. Oh yeah, you guys hit me parties. up. I'll put the solar on the, and then you guys party underneath, no problem. Your cost will come right down, make more money. What other projects are you working on at the moment? Um, currently we're working with the Energy Commission and some of the agencies to try and build out the electric infrastructure for electric vehicles. Okay. Um, I mean, they're not, I mean, they're not on board yet in terms of they don't understand the speed at which electric vehicles are going to take over. Mm -hmm. And they're not ready and prepared in any way, shape or form. But, you know, we, we are able to, we're, able to, we're able to see and project um, the, the level and the speed at which electric vehicles will take over from combust, um, combustion engines. So we're trying to sort of get them to understand and speed up that process of integration of electric vehicles into the system here because um, I mean, the demand is projected to actually triple. I mean, I would have one. If I could yeah. have one here, I would, but yeah. I mean, I'm just like, if I break down on the way to Cape Coast, <laughs> I'm, and nobody's coming to get me, you know? Like, I don't think that the engineers even are here to so fix electric the, cars, or what do yeah, you think? I mean, the good thing about electric cars is they don't really break down. They have like eight moving parts in total, uh, right? Okay. So uh -huh. they don't break down that often. Um, you don't have to do oil changes, you don't have to do any of that crazy stuff. So, as long as you don't, I don't know, drive off a cliff or something, I don't... No, I but I'm <laughs> sure there's a chance. But anyway, yeah. I guess that's the but, sort of thing the government yeah, yeah. should be so, behind. I mean, like it's, it's, the reliability of an electric vehicle far outweighs that of a, a normal combustion engine. Okay. 
okay. far outweighs it, right? So I think once people start to understand, you know, that you don't have to go to the mechanic every other week or whatever to fix this and fix that and change this and change that, everyone's going to go electric. Everyone's going to go electric. And as soon as that starts happening, especially with the Chinese pumping out cars, the Americans pumping out cars, the whole system is going to go electric and the cost of electric vehicles are going to come right down mm -hmm. and no one's going to buy a petrol diesel car anymore and then what happens to the infrastructure i think once that takes hold that understanding of the you know of, of people that electric vehicles are so much more affordable to run i mean think of the taxi drivers think of you know and because it's one eighth the cost to go the same distance mm -hmm. as a petrol or diesel car. So what right. does the government have to do though? Like what? So, I mean, first of all, they can increase the capacity of the energy that's actually being generated from one, okay. which they need to do anyway, um, because just demand and supply. Second, they have to start offering incentives to people to actually set up uh, electric vehicle charge, charging points, mm -hmm. you know, at vantage areas where people can easily get to, like you have ShopRite just behind us here. So ShopRite needs to have some electric charging stations and so on and so forth. You have to start building the infrastructure now because if you don't do it, you're going to have a serious problem when, you know, 10,000 people order electric vehicles from China and no one has anywhere to charge it. Yeah. Right, and everyone's looking at the government going, these guys are not serious, they're supposed to be in charge of the country. Mm -hmm. They need to be anticipating this sort of thing. Why aren't they doing it? You know, elections are coming up. Yeah. You know, that could be the that could be the swinging vote because they're like this, you know, government's not ready. Where are all the electric chargers? They have them in America, they have them in Europe, they have them all over the place. Well, why is Ghana behind? You know, and I think people are getting more and more demanding, especially when it when it affects their bottom line, you know? Mm -hmm. It affects their pocket. So we're working with the government to try and move things forward in that direction. I mean, they are, they are aware of it, but I mean, we're, they're not where we think they should be, given the speed at which things are going to start accelerating. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you haven't done so already, please hit that subscribe button and hit press it. the bell. Wait, wait. Hit it now. Go. Subscribe. We're watching you. Hit it. Well done. Well done. <laughs> If you're interested in Dyson Energy, then send us an email and I will forward that on to Michael. See you later. Bye. Bye.